So today we have this panel about adopting data science best practices, exploring cross-sector needs, challenges, and opportunities. We've already started these conversations in the morning with our amazing experts and residents and all the other people here as well. And thank you um, to many in the community in person online uh, for joining here today. So on our panel today, we have Neil, who is the director of the Software Sustainability Institute. We have Lauren, who's a data scientist at the Greater London Authority, or GLA. We have Simon, director of innovation at the Alvin Turing Institute, and Kirsty, Director of Tools, Practices, and Systems, and founder of the Turing Mind. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, from these very brief introductions I've shared, um, we've started to learn maybe a little bit more about you, and we've also learned a bit more about you this morning. Um, but beyond your current title and organization, each of you brings years of experience from fields like physics and neuroscience, engineering, um, at organizations spanning government, industry, and academia. So you're this great cross-section of the cross-sector um, that we hope to capture today. So to kick off the panel, I'd like to start by asking you about the you from 10 years ago. So perhaps in a somewhat relatable position to many of our experts in the room today, um, who've joined the Turing Ways Practitioners Hub with a vision and are in the midst of translating that into practice or scaling it up. I'm just I'm up. So in 2013, so 10 years ago, many of your organizations were new. The Greater London Authority, founded in 2000, the Software Sustainability Institute, founded in 2010, um, an RSE role point around that time as well, um, LRF, Lloyd's Register Foundation, uh, which Simon is affiliated with, set up in 2012. And the youngest of the group is actually the Alan Turing Institute, um, founded in 2015. And on top of that, uh, many of your roles were also very new 10 years ago. So we have the RSE role. Um, I think data scientists did exist, but I don't think many focused on city or high streets data. And I'm pretty sure that there weren't that many directors of innovation or tools or practices. So first question for all of you. Looking back, how might the you from 2013 view where you are today and the path you took to the organizations and roles you are pioneering? Would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So I uh, finished my PhD uh, at UC Berkeley in neuroscience in 2012. So 2013, I had moved to Cambridge um, and was working on a postdoc in the Department of Psychiatry. And um, basically was learning how to code in my sort of evenings. I went to this fantastic, went to a bunch of sort of um, women who code or, or sort of supportive, like learning to code kind of spaces. Usually in the evenings, I don't, I think I went to a couple of like hackathons at the weekend and things like that. And I was mostly learning to code because I wanted to make sure that I had an out to be able to go and have a, have a career that paid better than being in academia. Um, and then also had a much more supportive culture than being in academia because I wasn't very happy in my postdoc and I um, I wasn't very proud of the work that, that I was doing. I had been sort of coached all the way through my academic career up until that time that getting the publication out was the most important thing. Honestly, it didn't really matter if it was correct or not. Just sort of avoid like blatant lying in the paper. You know, don't fabricate data, Kirsty. But if you can just go ahead and get the significant result that everyone else has got, that would be really, really great, please. Um, and that's, you know, I, I don't want to sort of imply that there were particularly bad mentors throughout my career. That is still, to some extent today, a, a recommendation for how to have a successful career in academia. Um, I think the question was, would, would I be surprised or would I be curious about the role that I had today? I think in 2013, I think 2013 me would be really, really proud that I didn't sell out my values and I didn't leave academia. That was the tension that I was experiencing in 2013 was I can either do work that I'm proud of, that I think is robust, that I think is actually using a scientific method to answer interesting questions or I can have a career in academia. And I'm very proud that we sort of, in a collective, in the communities that I found along the way, allowed me to kind of keep pushing at that. Because I think what I feel very strongly is that no one starts a career in academia wanting to do 
unimpressive research. That is something that is like structurally incentivized. And I think probably 2013 was exactly the time when I was realizing that it was being incentivized and that there was some uh, responsibility to speak out about it. Well, that's good. We will lie. Um, so, hi, yeah, Simon. So, 2013, um, I was in Lloyd's Register, and the Lloyd's Register, for those that aren't aware, is actually two parts. So there's a business part and there's a charity part of foundation. So, at the time, I was in the business part in the energy business and actually heading an international team of business development specialists. And that particular change that year, I had to look this up to try and remember, was moving from a sort of geographic organisation to a global business organisation. So you were sort of thinking, well, what's the common objective? Why are we moving to a global business? And that was because we felt we were losing the focus on meeting the customer's needs. Now, part of meeting those customers' needs comes back to my earlier career when I worked in industry and for a while in the research side, and that was all about large product research and, and power generation. So improving the efficiency of a gas turbine, reducing the costs of these turbine blades, these sort of things in like energy and power applications. Um, and then in parallel with having that role in the business side of Lloyd's Register, I was also partly linked into the foundation because we we're always looking for research that the foundation might be sponsoring in the area of safety for application in the business side of energy, so ensuring energy parts and around the world safe. Um, and as uh, Jen said, Lloyd's Foundation was formed as a charity as it is now in 2012, off the back of what was previously an educational trust. And it's very similar to the Turing in many ways, and that the educational trust really just had a very wide remit to fund safety research and all sorts of areas. It's a really to be focused, so one of those focused areas. And part of the understanding that was sort of foresight process and ran a series of foresight reviews, including one on big data, which is a big issue that found about that time. One of the big challenges in areas of big data. Um, and one of those, uh, the outcomes of that was data-centric engineering was something that needed to be developed and understood in engineering courses. And so that led to the relationship the Turing and then the development of the data-centric engineering program uh, and getting that terminology <laughs> into business. And they had other um, safety focused priorities, safety of food, um, safety of skills, uh, and a whole host of other things at that time. So, the real sort of parallel with the, the Alan Turing Institute, where it is now, started off over the last seven years with quite a wide remit across different sectors and now becoming much more focused on, on what's important um, nationally and in line with the national strategic priorities. So I think, you know, for, for me, the, the learning which applies to all the sort of roles and situations I've had over the years is, is actually that focus of what's the next challenge we need to address, how do we take an organisation, a client, a business and sector from here to here, and how are we set up correctly to do that, have we got the right partnerships, have we got the right knowledge, um, and then we start to get plan together. Do for starters. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm Lauren. I am, as Jen said, a data scientist at the Greater London Authority. But in 2013, I was in my second year of graduate school, also doing a neuroscience degree. Um, and I remember the lab I was in was very, very small, and the, the community was very tight, and I really enjoyed my time there. But it was so lonely during doing research. You had like, one question. And you worked on it, and you went to lab, and you said hi, and you worked on it. Um, Twenty thirteen was the year before I essentially flagged my way to a collaboration with the lab across the country. This is all in the U.S. Um, I really had no business setting up this collaboration, um, but I thought it would be fun, and it did work out um, <coughs> because I really was getting tired of this real head down approach to, to science, where you just sort of incrementally try and produce something of value in this very niche field that maybe, maybe, I was doing color vision and perception research. So think about the number of people in the world that might care about that. <laughs> maybe six or seven, and they're quite old as well. <laughs> um, so I really, like, I just had this strong desire to sort of get my head up, sort of see the, the research landscape, you know, 
beyond just my desk or just just my research. And that collaboration with the other lab was was part of it. Um, and at the end of that research project, I just I, I wanted more. Um, so we had these two domains that were working with each other, uh, both very traditional labs. Um, by the end of the PhD, I had this small body of research, and it, it didn't really seem to matter very much without more context um, in the greater field of like vision research or neuroscience or behavior. Um, so I moved to the UK in 2017. I moved. I joined this very big lab studying behavior and navigation and decision making uh, using very big data methods. So to her kind of thing, like she reports from like very um, huge numbers of neurons at one time. And we were desperate to just get the bigger picture. It was always to get the bigger picture. Um, and as part of that, I ended up sort of leaving that question behind and, and joining what was then called and is now going on as the International Brain Laboratory, which is trying to answer even bigger questions with even more people um, decentralized across different lives across um, the US and Europe. And so looking back on it, and Jen, I'm really glad that you, you asked this question um, because it doesn't really seem like you've gone very far until you look back and you realize that you've actually done quite a bit. Um, it didn't all make sense, it didn't still all make sense. Um, but it's really clear to me now the through line of just ever seeking more context and more better context. Why you're doing what you do, what what drives your passion for the type of research you want to do. You, you have this sense of like rigor that, um, but by yourself it sort of seems meaningless. So the more people that you evolve, um, the more important it seems, but it also gets thorny as we all discussed in the morning. <laughs> it makes things much more difficult, but, um, but I think in a very important way. Would I be surprised in 2013 that I ended up in um, the public sector? Yes, probably. I was very, like, very much drilled in that there was, like, a one right path through academia. It's fascinating. Um, and I'm very, very glad not to be there right now, but I didn't know the time. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's a really good question. So I was thinking about this looking back to 2013, and, and in some ways the answer that I can give is the easiest one. What was I doing in 2013? I was director of the Software Sustainability Institute. but. But that's not a really interesting answer to your question, and it's maybe not the truthful one. So in 2013, um, the Software Sustainability Institute had been around for three years. When we set up, it was a very different thing from what we are now. It was very focused on uh, technical aspects of working with specific research groups to improve the quality and robustness and optimization of their software. So it was a really hands-on set of uh, engineers working with just six or seven um, projects across the UK uh, and trying to trying to do things like get them to get them to install test frameworks, get them to uh, make sure that they've they've worked out how to document their code and so on. Um, but there were a number of things happening around about 2013, 2012, 2013, that sort of changed the direction which we went. Some of these were personal to me and some of them were, were organizational. So I had never been in a, a position that I had stayed in for more than three years. Uh, and 2013 was the point at which naturally I would have done what I normally do, which is to go, brilliant, we've set up this project. I'm not a complete finisher. Uh, someone else can kind of take over and, and do this. Uh, I'd also, in my alternative career, um, I have a, an alternative arts career, I'd burnt out as a reviewer and I'd switched to the other side and got involved in uh, basically organizing arts festivals. And at that point, something clicked in terms of, of, of putting all the pieces together, putting together what we saw in some of the workshops we were running about giving people voice for and recognition for the roles that they were playing uh, as research software engineers, as research technical professionals, seeing how in the arts you have this wonderful way of making sure that you have continuity of information and being able to run things uh, without necessarily having to have continuity of people, which is both a good and bad thing. I can go into that at a coffee at that, that point. And also realizing that <clears throat> when we'd set up as the Software Sustainability Institute, we'd missed out two really important bits. One was pur purposeful, so we, we didn't do any training at that point because we didn't believe we could do it with the amount of effort that we had in our team. And we went, no, uh, 
someone else should fund this and someone else should do this. And the other thing was uh, we, we felt that um, there was something that we weren't getting right in terms of the scale of what we were doing. And that by just working directly with groups, we would only ever be able to scale, you know, seven projects every year. So at the end of five years, we would have done 35 projects and we wanted to get to a thousand projects. So, so what's happened looking back? I think partly what we've realized is that you've got to always work out how you are working with other people to achieve your goals. And so much of what we've been able to do in the last 10 years has only happened because we've been open to collaboration. And the other thing is around being able to give people a platform to do this on their own. And so much of that has been based on my understanding of how other organizations, other initiatives have encoded both guidance and information, but also provided support and, and space for people to do something. Uh, and, and the other, last thing I'll kind of finish on is, it was, it was what we were talking about in lunchtime. I think the biggest thing of hindsight that is different between me then and me now is a realization that these things take time <laughs> and space. But actually, as I get older and as the years go by so much faster, I start to think 10 years, We've done, it's like you said, we've done a lot in 10 years and we had to wait for it, but it happened. So, yeah. So I'm still in the same role. Um, uh, well, it's very different. It's very different. I went back into academia. So I'm now an academic. I do not believe I, I would have thought I would be an academic um, 10 years ago. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for weighing in on that and looking back uh, 10 years to 2013. Um, it's interesting to see, to hear some themes emerge around collaboration in and out of academia. Um, and it sounds like all of you have, um, perhaps before when you were um, director of SSI and in other parts of the 10 years with the other three, talked around different kinds of organizations, different fields, um, and different sizes of organizations. So looking back a bit more, um, I'm interested to hear um, how your past lives and the best practices maybe you brought from other sectors that you've worked in, um, how that has been brought to your current roles. So maybe as an example, we could start with Percy and Lauren, who both have backgrounds in neuroscience um, and imaging standards. So how have your past lives as neuroscientists influenced your current approach to work at organizations like the Turing and the GFA? Okay. Um, I would say that I think most of neuroscience, and I hope there's, there are no other neuroscientists on the call to challenge me on this, doesn't <laughs> have very good data practices in general. Um, but in this postdoc role that I was in in, in London, uh, we had this idea that like the biggest questions that people wanted to ask about behavior and, and decision making couldn't be done by a single postdoc anymore. They were just too big to do. Um, and hopefully that's an idea that like a lot of research teams are present with, that you have these, these enormous questions that require tons and tons of data, um, but the first hour is just kind of too So we really had to put our heads together with how we were going to create um, a sort of net, a research network that basically brought in all the right people from the class that were doing similar types of work together um, virtually um, to undertake a single research question and, and basically create a data um, acquisition and process pipeline that was standardized enough so that we were reasonably confident the data were the same coming from any particular lab. And that has, that's been done in places like physics. Uh, so we used Atlas and CERN as a, as a model, um, or at least tiny, like 20 or 20 less. Um, but it was very difficult because people were not used to working together. Um, and I think particularly for experimental neuroscientists, you're used to having control of like all the buttons and reagents and things on your, on your bench when you do work and to outsource that process to people in other places with other sort of cultural sensibilities about what's appropriate research. It's really, really hard thing to do because you have to give that ownership away. So we didn't really have a good roadmap for how that was going to look in neuroscience, um, but we we have tried. Um, I don't think it's a complete success. Um, but in terms of creating like a centralized um, like data feed, so experimentalists who are at the rig can feed all of their data for a single experiment into like a central server right away. Um, all the code is written in Python. There's like a, a, a 
body of staff meant just to maintain the code base. Um, so that's not one post sucks job. Um, anyone who's dabbled in academia knows that everyone's a data scientist, <laughs> but not by choice. Um, so trying to create some of these, these structures to create sort of the, the most seamless transition into this sort of group for today. And a lot of the stuff that we worked on, we certainly didn't solve all the problems that we faced, um, has been really, really helpful in this role with the GLA. Uh, because the GLA is an enormous organization with tons of moving parts. And the thing that makes the GLA more, more complicated than, say, um, the behavioral neuroscience domain, which is tiny, um, is that everyone is coming at it from a perspective. Some people are super data confident, data literate, other people are more from a policy perspective. Um, there's lots of like <coughs> silos in different places that you have to sort of crack, crack open. Um, but trying to bring some of those skill sets, some of those things that we were thinking about in sort of the controlled environment of behavioral neuroscience to a greater organization with more diversity um, is incredibly helpful. This is something that we're, we're trying to do to make sure people can to be more so I have I have some experiences that are <coughs> really overlapping with that. So I was part of um, I was part of the the inaugural um, steering group of the brain imaging data structure, and the bids community have been some of my highest highs and my lowest lows <laughs> in the um, in the brain imaging space. So brain imaging data structure is something just a little bit more than a guide for how to organise your files and name them. And um, the magic that comes with that is that if we all organize our files in the same way, it means that when we write code to be able to analyze them, you can now use my code. Other people can use that code. You can check to see what else is going on. Even if it's sensitive data, um, you can share the code and you can work on it. So I'm extraordinarily proud of that community. I'm extraordinarily proud of the work that, um, that we've created together. And also, holy moly, the, the feelings people have about how you want to name their files. <laughs> wow! People have really serious feelings. I co-led on um, the bid 001. It only got merged in 2022. It was around for about seven or eight years. It was the first, it was the first extension uh, for the original, the original standard, and it was on quantitative structural imaging. This is not a major section <laughs> of brain imaging. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to do the quantitative. You have to have a particular scanner, a particular physicist, things like that. Um, and yet, wow, wow, the feelings. Um, and it, and that's I'm being slightly funny about it because the point that I want to make is that actually. It was an extraordinary learning experience for how communities can work together because one of the really uh, sort of dangerous patterns that I witnessed as in the BIDS community at the beginning was that people who didn't feel confident to participate in the conversation just withdrew. So you don't tend to see that, that many people online in a GitHub issue bursting into tears, having huge meltdowns. It does happen. You do have some meltdowns, but the vast majority of the signal is in their missingness, is in the people who you know I care about this, you know are working in this field, you know have something to contribute, and they don't. And part of that is discoverability, but a huge aspect of it is project culture, community culture. How do we facilitate these disagreements? Literally about how to like name a file, come on. And yet, it, it limits, it wildly limits the impact of the project if you have a vast majority of people who aren't participating. So it's got this huge thread of sort of equity, diversity and inclusion, global inclusion. How do you reach out to people who don't know yet about the project? And also so that you don't sort of have so many cooks that you never actually make anything and you just have lots and lots of conversations over and over again. That's a, so that's a tension that is very, very difficult to navigate. And I've taken a lot of lessons from that community and shout out to all of my friends who are at the Organisation for Human Brain Mapping Conference right now in Montreal. And I, I miss being a neuroscientist quite a lot. <laughs> the other two things that I have brought from the sort of the previous life as a neuroscientist is 
Uh, one, I think it was one of the earlier fields to recognize a reproducibility crisis. So I would say like psychology and economics probably had it kind of the most, had the most vocal advocates. It bled over into neuroscience, re- at least human brain imaging, which is what I did reasonably early and I look I thought at the time I was working in the field that was like the most useless <laughs> but actually I now think we are all working in fields that are terribly useless it's just we have different <laughs> levels of understanding about them and then the other aspect that I think is I'm very proud of to have this neuroscience background is there's no gold standard for understanding the human brain. You literally can't, like if you sliced it up, which you could do, it doesn't think anymore. It doesn't behave. It's very difficult to actually get any sort of time varying information once you have sliced up someone's brain. So everything you're doing is a proxy. And so from the very first day of my PhD, all of my peers were talking about what is it that we are asking when we ask this statistical model? What is the data? It isn't the brain. It isn't thought. It isn't act- even activity. Everything is a proxy for all of those things. And I think the training that we had for what is the thing we care about? What is the real question that we want to know? And what are the questions we are able to ask? And what are the limitations between the, the gap between those two positions? I think that's something that neuroscience does very, very well. And I actually think lots of domains do do very well. But I'm not totally convinced that um, a lot of our machine learning, the big machine learning AI models, have sort of embraced that thinking. And I'd love to see some more of that expertise, which I don't think belongs just to neuroscience. It's just it's easy to see how you can't slice up someone's brain. Um, I think we need more of that coming back into some of our, our AI thinking. Thank you both for weighing in on that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us to the next question and also give one more plug for the Slido. We'll be opening up for questions after this next question. Um, I think we have a few in Slido, but please do add some more. Um, so just put that in the chat. Um, so a big theme this morning was this topic of culture change. And this, you know, we had this conversation about a skills gap. Is it really a skills gap or is it a culture gap? Um, how can we change the culture that can then enable many of the best, best practices that we would like to see in the world? Um, and something very integral to the turn way as a community is the importance of culture um, to enable the sustainable adoption of best practices. So as leaders who have been tasked with bringing about culture change to make better software engineering, uh, better data science, um, and innovation possible. Um, I'm curious to hear about how you created a safe space or environment where new ideas are welcome and incentivized, where maybe some failure is possible and people feel comfortable experimenting, putting new new ideas forth. And um, as we've already heard, I think it's super helpful to hear these specific experiences um, from your sector or your own experience. So maybe we can start with Neil and Simon for for this round. Um, As the founder of the Software Sustainability Sustainability Institute, um, how did you approach creating new space um, that you used for building your community? Yeah, um, I, that's a really good, a really good question. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened with the research software engineering movement. I think that's a good example of trying to create a space for something to to, to have traction and to kind of make progress. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I sort of saw previously in some of the work I did in kind, in kind of like technology standardization was that effectively, if you wanted to be a part of those communities, you needed to pay to play. So it was very hard for individuals to get involved in defining the the vision and the direction of any particular movement or initiative. But then when you look at a lot of things which are around campaigning and advocacy, you sort of see very, very similar um, foundations for all of them. You have, you have the ability of communities to come together so that individuals can participate uh, and, and uh, it, it's basically a meritocracy. But you also have something called a backbone organization that can support them and do a lot of the, the kind of the administrative organization work as well as the defending people if some of the things that they do stray, seem to stray off course for, for where this initiative, um, this movement goes. So, so what the SSI did really was it gave a platform 
as a backbone organization to allow people to understand what needed to happen. So when we first started, so 2012, we held a workshop very much like the one we're having today, uh, where uh, one of the breakout groups was talking about recognition of professionals working on software. And after that, having kind of identified this as something we wanted to pursue, the key thing at the early stages was being able to give people the space to voice differing opinions in this area whilst protecting the scrutiny from outside as we were trying to work out what we were. So we had a lot of different blog posts at that point, a lot of different communications, papers and so on that were exploring all of the different ways people felt a research software engineer could be. And we came to the realization that that was the thing, that there were many, many different types of research software engineer. And the key thing was making sure that they were given the recognition and incentivization to do what they needed to do without trying to go, oh, okay, so you're this kind of research software engineer, or you're that kind of research software engineer. Um, a lot of what we got in the early days was, for instance, all research software engineers should should sit within the IT services part of a university, or all research software engineers should sit within the research groups. And we were going, that's not the argument we need to have here. As a community, we need to say, we should have research software engineers. Um, and so in terms of kind of creating a safe space for people to explore these, I think it is about protecting them from, from both the fighting that goes on as a community starts organizing to start with, and also to give them the space to, to, to basically have everything come together where everyone can read it. So this is the openness as well. You don't want these discussions to take place in private. You want to see them take place in the community, in the open. But adjudicate, there's a lot of adjudication. I think mostly what, um, what I learned from that time is that you really do need skilled facilitators to do this. And a lot of what I did in the early days was act as a facilitator and also as a counsellor, talking to people, trying to understand where they were coming from and uh, why they were so passionate about this so that we can direct all of that passion. And, and yeah, now 10 years later, we have a professional society established. Uh, we have groups across many of the universities who couldn't understand where they would put the people. It doesn't matter. They have some of them in the central uh, IT um, services, some of them at the research groups, some of them in between. And so we've had that space to explore all of the different ways we can professionalize this role. Uh, and with a bit of time and uh, some, some judicious use of funding, yeah, uh, I think we've, we've achieved a lot in tech. So it's interesting because uh, Neil's example there and, and my experience in Lloyd's Register around about 2015 is, is very similar. Um, so the situation we had there in, in the maritime sector, but also the energy sector and other industrial sectors was that the, the sort of former linear sort of research teams were struggling to keep up with the needs of the clients, particularly as you know, digitalization was becoming a, a big thing in, in industry. Um, and we needed to change the whole thinking and, and the mindset. And so it was decided um, strategically we ought to sort of move from a linear research way of thinking in our technology teams to more of an agile innovation way of thinking. Um, but we didn't want it just to be you know, the internal team. We wanted that agile innovation thinking and approach to be spread across the whole of the business. So it was about, you know, I mentioned before about moving from geographic structures to, to business structures. It's about what are the challenge areas and, and how can we create the environment where people start to sort of cross collaborate across different businesses as well as different geographies and, and understand it and work together. So we did that. Um, we actually sort of we branded some of the, uh, the office centers we had. We created a technology center in Southampton and a technology center in Singapore. We moved some people around so that some of the people in Southampton didn't sort of look at all them, but those that wanted to, we managed to move a couple to Singapore and likewise the other way. Um, at the time, I also had a very sort of uh, bright young um, research leader up in uh, Aberdeen working in the energy sector, and then the maritime team in Southampton were quite insular. So I, with her agreement, arranged to move her into the Southampton office and, and sort of gradually ask the questions and break down the sort of thinking and start that cross collaboration between the energy team and the maritime team. 
But at the same time, we needed to engage the businesses. So we created um, a, a global platform, uh, basically an ideas platform, which we communicated very widely and said, look, we are looking to source ideas from around the business of things that you see your local clients need to improve largely in the, sort of the digital space. And then we had a team of people from you know, different centres assessing those ideas on a monthly basis and, in, and, and communicating those openly. So, the, the, I mean, the sort of things that today just seem like normal common sense way to do stuff. So well, for example, that for chewing what is a great example of that now in practice. But at the time, that was quite a change, particularly for a fairly traditional industry, like the marine industry in particular, energy industry, I would say less traditional. To move from that you know, structured department thinking to international collaboration, cross collaboration, cross sector, sharing ideas and trying to move things forward. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's that approach, um, again, a different perspective. Um, so now to transition to some questions on Slido. We have one that's quite related to the conversation um, that we're having now. Um, <laughs> so um, the broader question, and I'll squeeze in a few other related questions, is how do you motivate and encourage your teams to contribute and collaborate, specifically when many organizations share a culture of fear to failure? Um, and some Many targeted questions I'll just pop in. For example, Kirsty, how do you encourage people who might be silent on GitHub? How do you even know they're there? And then Neil, when you spoke about facilitation and counseling, how did you learn those skills that would be required to direct some of those thorny conversations? So maybe you can start with these. Can you say the first one again? The big one. Yeah. So how do you motivate and encourage your teams to contribute and collaborate? I think my team might might have a sort of slightly um, <laughs> strongly opinion answer about how I how I motivate my team. I was talking about this at lunchtime actually. I I oscillate, um, and I'm a solo parent, and my baby is 14 months old, so I don't sleep very much, and uh, so I os oscillate in a slightly sort of chaotic <laughs> manner between. Um, trying to inspire, trying to demonstrate failure, demonstrate uncertainty, demonstrate that I'm doing something that's you know, not, not been done before and there's something exciting and, and sort of there's a great privilege to be able to change the world, to have a salary that allows me to sort of wake up in the morning and think, what is the most important thing? Um, I, I try to give a sort of, you know, an inspirational call to action and then I balance that with also trying to find a space of psychological safety. And the um, my I would say my implementation of that is that, you know, <laughs> sort of exceeds the, the, the distribution on either side quite often. But um, I do think that fundamentally inspiring people through role modeling, through through sort of being able to see, see has changed, see a, a um, see how difficult conversations are about being able to witness three people disagreeing but disagreeing in a respectful way and finally getting to a consensus point um, I think allowing people to see that process, see that it's slow, see that it can be done uh, I think is a factor and then the psychological safety aspect is just really about I think people who are, who are afraid, people who have short term contracts people who have lots and lots of other responsibilities, people who don't feel appreciated for their work, it's not possible for them to think big and to think creatively and to have the courage to go and, and step outside of the status quo and try and change the way that, that the world and the world of research, the world of sort of data and industry works. And so sort of trying to find the ways of supporting them and also giving them, you know, I would say I, I, I aim for a push more than a nudge. I aim for a push. I think sometimes I sort of do like a running like, <laughs> shoulder barge um, <laughs> to try and sort of have people feel, um, I guess, the, the purpose of why, why we do this work. 
Yeah, I, I was trying to think think how I, how I'd answer this. So in terms of in terms of the broader kind of giving people the, the space and the uh, to work, I think in addition to what you said, Kirsty, the other thing that I think it is my role as, as director to do is robustly defend them from the outside and their critics because you know uh, people there are people in our community who are not the, the sort of collaborative open empathetic people that we would like our community to be and they are instead more more um from the more robust cut and thrust side of academia or uh, or industry and so i think my job is really to take the flat um, and so uh, a lot of what I will do is just kind of go like, no, you can say that's a criticism of the organization, but you cannot say it's a criticism of the person, because if it's a criticism of the person, then it's their, their kind of like team lead. And then by going all the way up, my, my responsibility for them having got something um, that you think is not what we needed to have quite often it's what i think we needed to have but that's not necessarily what the outside world so taking the flat is i think the kind of key bit there um how did i learn all of this facilitation and, and skills i don't know because i'm an introvert i really don't like communicating directly with people i, I hate telephone calls for instance i can't do telephone calls um so I don't think I've got a good answer for this. I think it's mostly that I have learned from seeing how lots of different people that I respect do it in different areas. And I think that's maybe a key thing. If, if I'd only grown up in the world of physics and only seen how it was done in, in particular one sort of physics of a particular organization size and a particular um, structure of how uh, leadership and governance was done, I wouldn't be able to kind of have... Uh, the ability to empathize with different people in different situations. But I've seen a lot of different types of research across every sort of discipline. And I think learning from that and learning from how you do it in volunteer organizations has really helped. So breadth of experience is probably it, but I do wish I'd had some formal training because I always fear that I'm getting it completely wrong and I'm actually going to hurt someone sometimes. So yeah. Come in on that. Um, I would say food and drink. <laughs> it always works for me and most of the teams that, 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 that I've led. But seriously, it's about how do you create an atmosphere where people start to think a bit more laterally? Just give you two examples. One right back early in my career, I was a, a factory director of partnership with the big turbine out at uh, late and everything was going wrong. We were making the problems, shipping problems. And the only complication that we had to get it out within 24 hours because the lorry had to go past Old Trafford and the police wouldn't let us go past the football ground <laughs> when there was a international match get, getting on. The team had already worked all day. They were getting frustrated and tired with each other and sorting these problems out. So I thought, well, what's going to make the difference again to stay a little bit longer? So I popped out to the local chip shop and bought a load, load of chips in that situation. A number of years later, um, this was a team in, in Singapore who were used to my monthly meeting in a room like this. And they all come in with a coffee and sit down and I listen to Simon phoning on for 15, 20 minutes or whatever. And I said, I put your coffee cups down. I said, we're going to go out to a local coffee shop. Um, hang on, what's this about? So, yeah, I'll buy you coffee. We went out to a local coffee shop for 10, 15 minutes. And right now, we're going to walk around, and it's a very similar environment to here in the knowledge quarter. Because what was happening there is a fairly young research team, and they were all sort of sitting in their own little huddles, just thinking about their own problems and solving them themselves without considering the partners that had businesses and other research teams literally within a kilometre of where they were sat. And so, we, we then spent the next two hours walking around. And then, you know, so we've got here places like Google, DeepMind, and some of the things exactly the same in this particular part of Singapore. So you might have got that organization does this, that organization does that. That's exactly aligned with what you're doing this project. Then. So let's think differently. So sometimes you say just creating a, whether it's food or drink first, and then trying to think, let's think differently about how we can take things forward. And for me, that's a really important way to think. For, for weighing in on that. Um, so the next question is directed to Lauren, but I think all of you would have the same things to share. Um, and the question, is again, another question, is do you have any tips for people early in their career to reach out to people worldwide to form successful international collaborations, as you have all of them? Um, and if there are any success stories 
or case studies that you would highlight of successful open science collaborations, particularly those outside of the academia? Um, great. So perhaps we can start with Lauren and anyone else. Yeah. So the question is, how to do it? How to do it right? Okay. I know how to try it. Um, I think the important thing to remember, and this, and my going to change it now, but maybe I'll, I'll wait till later um, about the importance of writing things down so you remember how it actually went. Um, now, a few years past the start of this international um, collaboration in neuroscience, it's easy to think it was like everyone just had this really big idea and it just happened. Just it literally was like two or three postdocs who came to my lab and said, so like, what do you do here? And I gave much more of a lab and showed them some equipment. They said, that's weird how you do that. Okay. And it was really, really small and we didn't know each other. Um, and what I am hoping to, to like bring up through this is that it was very, it was prescribed. So my supervisor said, you have to host these people because we're starting an international brain collaboration. <laughs> it's going to start here. Um, I had been in my role for about a month. I was petrified. I had no idea what the lab did, let alone how we were going to get open source and globalized. I decided to host two or three people for the day. And we just had a nice chat. And it, it was fine. And I think the reason that it worked really well is because the other people who came into the lab we're also postdocs, so we're all sort of in this precarious employment situation. We were sort of new to the field. Um, we didn't have tenure, like we weren't running research programs. We were all just genuinely curious about the questions that we were um, hired to solve. And I think we were all maybe a tiny bit lonely as well, that we were all doing this independently. Um, so at the end of the meeting, we had sort of created this little friendship um, and we had a few tasks that sort of emerged from the friendship. And, I think this carries on nicely from the question before, is that, and I think this is what the three of you kept saying, you really have to embody openness, like in your actual physical behavior, in order to like promote an atmosphere of openness in your scientific practice. And I think this is a really tricky thing, because if we had all not gotten along and were insulting each other, the collaboration probably would have fallen to its knees, like at that end of that day. Um, but there was enough sort of camaraderie, there was enough um, sort of synthesis, there was enough sort of co-understanding of each other and where we were coming from that it really did have like, so we could continue to sort of, we gradually brought in more and more people. Um, so there's a huge like culture aspect to that and actually like really physically committing yourself to the operation instead of, it's easy to sit in a room and say, which is all, all of our supervisors did this said, we're going to create this international brain laboratory. We're not going to do it. Y'all are going to do it. Um, and we had to actually physically practice it ourselves. And so we really built it from the ground up. And I think that's a really important thing to do in creating a collaboration is to get the people who are directly doing science involved. Um, not the people who think they're doing the science. Um, and it's going to be messier. You're going to have less leverage, you're going to have less agency because we were, we were just supposed to ask a couple grad students. We really didn't have much power. Um, but we were the most proximal to where the, those data were coming from where the science was happening. And that let us sort of break down some silos right away. Um, we were able to bring in people from, from the ground up. So it was really, truly grassroots. So I think that's a, a really successful way to start a program. Can I, can I add something to that? So um, I think that's really lovely from it. it. It's sort of grassroots in the sense of like there was no framework and you had to do it. But there was also, there was a bunch of leadership buy-in, right, <laughs> that said you have to do it. Yeah. I think there's another way of looking at this question of saying, I'm feeling a bit isolated. I want to get involved. How do I, like, how do I reach out? And I think uh, there's a real skill in asking interesting questions. You don't have to be that interesting to ask interesting questions. It's a little bit like going on a date. Like I, I sort of the number of people who I, I, I they go on dates and they say, "Did that person ask you any questions about yourself?" And the number of people that say no is so sad, and depressing. <laughs> and so when it comes to sort of building connections in the science or the data science sphere, ask. Ask questions. Those questions that you think are quote unquote stupid questions, they're almost certainly not. Run them by someone, just real quick. Just run them by someone real quick just to check that they're not like really, really stupid 
questions. But the vast majority of types of people love talking about themselves. They love, ask them all these panel questions. They love talking about that. And then also be ready with a yes pound. So I think one of the things that I've sort of witnessed um, that quite a lot of sort of PhD students that I talk with now feel, they feel disempowered. And there are aspects of there where they do have less power, but actually they also, just building on exactly this point, they are also the people who actually work with the data. They actually write the code. They actually do do the work or they go out and they talk with the people who are sort of contributing into creating a, a, a community. And that is for a good senior kind of leader, that's all dust. That is so important to, to find. And so make sure that you've got, uh, you're sort of ready with an offer. This is something that I could do that would be able to help and participate. Um, ask the questions, find out what the other, you know, what the people sort of need and then be ready as best you can, either in the moment if you're sort of quick thinking or, or as a follow-up, you know, email after the fact to say, here's something that I could do that you might be interested in. And what's really nice about openness, just to stand on my soapbox that we are all sharing today, is you don't have to do any contracts. There's no agreement around whether they want to use it at all. You can just share with them what it is that you've built, what it is that you're, you're participating in. And if they want to participate back, there's no barriers to that. The, ba the barrier is the culture or the discoverability of it. Um, but you can sort of help people to participate in that. And loads of people, lots of people want it. Lots of people want those connections. They want people to help them achieve their goals. And I think the key is figuring out what it is that others are, others are needing and what you can bring. Just, just to kind of add on that, I think, I think a large part of this is it's very hard when you think you're the only person. So you're trying to find your collaborators and doing that kind of networking. I think um, one of the tips I had when I was trying to learn what, what is this networking thing? Because, yeah, introverts networking doesn't work very well. Um, and, and someone told me, your aim here is, is to talk to other people, to find out what they do, and then be able to understand, almost like one of these puzzles where you keep on flipping the tiles to find a match. Find the match for that person with someone else you've talked to, because then you are a networker. You're creating a network. And then eventually you'll find the person who matches with you. But you're not doing that by telling people what you do. You're telling, you're, you're finding that out by finding out what they do. And I'm thinking about particularly, I've seen this, uh, so the, um, the format that's now used for software citation in things like GitHub and uh, Zenodo, um, two of the big infrastructures that a lot of researchers use, started because someone who was at the time a student, Stefan Triska, was coming along going like, I'm really interested in this. And just trying to find and talk to other people to work out who else in this, this arena was also interested by just kind of asking those questions and eventually is enough and then there's then there's formal structures if you're in the academic world you can you can go to your your conferences and you can propose a birds of a feather session but almost all of those require you to have a collaborator so your aim is to find the one other person who is passionate about what you want to do as you are and you do that through networking we're almost out of time. If we could just ask one last question, rapid fire, go through everyone on the panel, if that sounds all right. Um, I'd like to rephrase a great question from Rowan. Um, what do you think made the biggest impact uh, to scale up your work for the past few years? Or maybe another way to answer is what suggestions might you have for the Turing Way Practitioners Health community who assemble as they think about how they should approach scaling up their work? decentralization so we learned a lot from the carpentries and from other other organizations to kind of go we could do the, try and do this all this ourselves and keep all the credit it's not going to scale so give the credit freely to, to other people and and then you can scale <laughs> I will jump on my soapbox now and say, drop it, drop it, drop it some more. Um, it's the worst part of collaborating is like the institutional memory, um, but it is indeed the most important part. Um, and it doesn't seem important at any 
like instant in time until your time to death, like 10 years away, you realize that no one actually <laughs> wrote it down. <laughs> so really, really write it down because it's just going to save yourself a lot of grief in the future. And it really helps you celebrate like your progress as well. So. I would say communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs> uh, particularly beyond your current network. We all tend to be very good research communities of communicating the next thing to our existing community, but there's so many more people out there that just as a commerce institution, you know, that would be interested in have a use. And if you don't make them aware of it, you're not going to get that opportunity to scale. I'm going to say that there's a there's a quote that I think I'm going to butcher right now of um don't, don't be tricked into thinking that one person can't change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. And I think just taking one step, it doesn't even have to be every day. Some days you're allowed to just lie down on the floor and give up because it's really, really hard doing all of this work and changing culture. But one person doing one step and just taking, just taking little bites out of this kind of great big challenge that we're facing um it is it is the only way to change the world and i think neil said it earlier and i think it's totally true i i give these inspirational motivating speeches about how i can see change over a decade so keep going because <laughs> change will come if you hang in there 10 years i can see a difference but it's true i really can see a difference in 10 years on a day to day month by month and honestly even year by year it's very, very difficult to see. So I think there's an element of making sure that you keep going and also rest and sustain yourself for the fact that this is a very, very much a marathon and not a sprint. That's been being so close. Thank you to our panelists for your thoughts and experiences and everyone online and in person for joining us as well. Um, I think now we're off to a break before coming back for our afternoon session. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.